Well, it is my privilege to introduce our guest today. She teaches English here at Biola University. This is her ninth or tenth year, something Somewhere like that, right? Yeah. Okay. Her ninth or tenth year teaching, and she's developed uh, and teaches the race and ethnicity in American literature course. That is a general education course at Biola University. Um, uh, she is a first-gen college graduate. I am. And she just finished her PhD last year. Yeah. Help me welcome Dr. Shelley Garcia. Thanks for having me. Well, Shelley, your expertise is in the is is in the literature of uh, in the stories of minority voices. Yeah. Why is that something that we need to pay more attention to? It's such a great question. When I saw the question, I was thinking, "Wow, I could spend um, a long time talking about it." I won't, because I know we have a bunch of questions. Um, but in some ways, that is part of my expertise, it's part of my training, it's a lot of what I spend my time teaching. Um, my academic training is as an Americanist, so contemporary American literature, um, and then subspecialties, kind of ways that I have focused in beyond just kind of the broad canon of American literature, is kind of um, gender and minority discourses. So the course that you mentioned, Race and Ethnicity, is one that I teach a lot. Um, I also teach courses just kind of on American literature broadly. I teach upper division courses on uh, US ethnic writers or contemporary women writers. Mm -hmm. um, I also teach a course on modernism, right? So it's, it's a, as canonical as you can get when it comes to American literature. Yeah. Um, so I, I say that to say that it's, I don't think about the importance of teaching my minority voices exclusively, mm -hmm. right? It, to me, is part of teaching literature broadly requires mm. that we pay attention to all of those voices, not yeah. just a select few that have traditionally been the kind of central parts of the canon. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about the question of why minority voices, right? Like why pay attention? And I think about my own story and I think about what it was like. I grew up being an avid reader, mm. um, but it wasn't until I was an undergrad and I began to be exposed to um, writers of color, in particular female authors of color, and the experience was like inhaling deeply for the first time and mm. realizing that I had been without oxygen up until that point. Mm. And so for me, it was incredibly powerful to see my own story yeah. reflected. Yeah. Um, but I also think that it's not just about those of us seeing ourselves in story, but it's also about the capacity of narrative to expand our own worldview, our own empathy, right? Mm -hmm. I think when you encounter other people, whether in person or in text, you are able to kind of see what their experience has been, mm. why they think the way they do about the world, and it expands our own framework in a way yeah. that I think is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, I also think that the, the kind of value of minority voices is Again, it reflects the full spectrum of humanity, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, one of the one of the ways I think about this is the story, of the parable of the Good Samaritan. So, um, yeah. we talk about this in my race and ethnicity class early on in the semester. We start off our first unit of readings is on kind of uh, first contact and discovery and colonization of the New World and the first kind of European kind of writings about. Uh, indigenous peoples, and then we eventually get to writings by Native Americans. Um, but one of the conversations that we have is about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And, mm. you know, it's one that we're familiar with as kids. We get it often in Sunday school, and it's the kind right. of, you know, the, the Levi and the priest go by, and then eventually it's the Samaritan who right. kind of um, behaves as the good, kind of the good neighbor. But for me, one of the things that more recently I've been paying attention to is the, the frame of the narrative mm. is actually the legal scholar comes to Jesus wanting to test him yeah. and ask kind of like, what do I have to do to kind of get eternal life? And I think, well, if we're Christians, we should be paying attention to any conversation about what does it mean to kind of gain eternal life. Yeah. Jeez, and, you know, Jesus' answer is another question, right? Like, well, you're a scholar of the law. Tell me, what, it, what do you read? And he responds with, a, you know, love your the Lord, your God, um, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And for me, the real kind of perhaps subtle but really important key of the interaction is yeah. the legal scholar's responses. And it, we're told the narrator says um, he wanted to justify himself, and so he mm -hmm. asks, who is my neighbor? Right. 
And in my class, we talk about the fact that so much of what, so much of the problems in the kind of early American history and the conquest of the Americas was, you know, white European Christians um, not seeing these people as their potential neighbors, right, right? right? And the question about who is my neighbor was really a question about who is outside the boundary that I am responsible to treat well. Right. And I think that for me is, is something that I keep returning to. Mm. And, the, and I hadn't thought about this until your question. And I think some of the reasons I feel called to share and teach the story of minority voices is because it's part of seeing other people as our neighbors, yeah. right? To see the fact that people that we may have assumed are profoundly different than us actually in many ways yeah. are very much like us. Yeah, well, if I could return back to your story, I'd love to hear more of your story, and I'd love to hear how you went from first-generation college student to PhD, doctorate, yeah. right? And uh, how, what, what was that like for you, and um, how did you, get, how did you uh, go through that? Yeah, um, it's interesting. When I think about my story, I think it's part of the reason why I am so passionate about education and why I feel profoundly blessed to get to do the work that I do. Yeah. Uh, because I've seen in my own life that education completely changed the trajectory of mm. my life. Um, I grew up, my, uh, both my sister and I were really good students, um, and the expectation was that we would go to college. Our, neither of our parents had um, completed college. And so we knew kind of early on that we were supposed to go. It was like the thing we were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, I went in thinking, well, I'm going to get a degree, but I really want to be a makeup artist. So I had no intention of using my degree. <laughs> um, but along the way, it freed me up to just study what, um, what I was interested in, what I began to kind of discover new passions for. Mm. So I started off as a sociology major and an English minor and a women's studies minor. And, and this was actually at Vanguard, so I kind of, you know, sister school to Biola. And they're okay. Yeah, yeah but, you know, yeah. They're, they're okay. Yeah. No. Um, uh, but it was in the process of, you know, just kind of in some ways studying for fun and thinking I was going to, you know, have a career as a makeup artist that I got a paperback from a professor. This is the end of my junior year. And they wrote on there, have you ever thought of grad school? Mm. And I remember, I've, I've described it as, it's not just like the light bulb moment, it's like an entire room of light bulbs and they just all go on. Wow. And it was as if, no, why had, I, why had I never considered this? Why did it not seem something that was possible for me? And when I think about that, I think about the fact that so much of what it means to be a first-gen student is um, your framework for possibility can be limited because of the the, the kind of your context, right? Yeah. You don't, like I didn't travel around, like I didn't interact with people who had PhDs, right? Like it wasn't right. until I was in, um, in college that I actually met people with PhDs and then saw that it was potentially something that I could do. Um, and so I think about that as a, a really kind of um, an important turning point for me. Yeah. And, and I will also say that when I had my, so I was, I started teaching here when I was still a grad student. Um, but my first class, I remember teaching it and feeling like the experience of teaching here, having my class for the first time, um, it felt like it was a kind of clear sign of God's work in my life and God's like healing and kind of just, for the first time it felt like the person I was made sense mm. um, and that I had often kind of thought of myself as a bit of a misfit or a freak or something or weird. Um, <laughs> but that when I was in the classroom and I was teaching, the way I was wasn't an accident. It was kind of the way God made me. Mm. And so I think about the ways that the work that I get to do is so, like, it's so incredible. I feel really blessed. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know, Shelly, in, in college, I was a history major, okay? And so yeah. I have a sense of American history. Yeah. But what do I miss if I just read a history book? What do I miss about minority voices that yeah. might not be in the history books? It's a great question. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, nothing and everything, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of us have a kind of good general outline of, of what American history is. Um, and I think part of the oversight of textbooks, uh, I think back to my high school textbooks, um, it was a very kind of narrow perspective um, and perhaps incomplete mm -hmm. perspective about um, what has happened. But in, in some ways, even if you have you are an incredibly diligent student of history, right? The, the value of um, 
both first person accounts, so like autobiographies or nonfiction pieces or kind of creative works, um, is getting the first person perspective yeah. that is so vital, yeah. right? One of the conversations that I have with my students is the fact that they can, you know, they can tell me, yeah, I learned about slavery or I knew about lynching, um, but I'd never read a slave narrative mm. or I hadn't read, um, you know, poetry describing um, lynching in the South, right? Mm. Wow. And so I think there's something about both the, perhaps what is missing in traditional history is the breadth of perspective. Mm. Um, but I think one of the, the kind of disciplinary or genre differences between like history and kind of literature is um, we're not necessarily bound by kind of f straight up fact. We also get to, st to like I get to teach fictional pieces mm. and talk about the fact that there is both truth in fiction, right? Yeah. And sometimes a story we were just reading in my class, we read a short story about um, uh, Chinese immigration at the turn of the 20th century. And we were talking about the fact that we could have conversations about immigration and policy. They could be kind of political science conversations or history conversations. But there's something about reading a short piece that can get at the heart of yeah. um, the human experience of Absolutely. those same issues. Yeah. Well, uh, if you think about what is going on today and what are some of the narratives that yeah. we might need to pay attention to more in contemporary American literature. My first instinct when I saw this question was to like say, here's my syllabus, come like, <laughs> here's this, or let me like come visit my office, it's really fantastic, I can show you all the books that are there that I would recommend. And in some ways, right, like, I think that there is a way that there is perhaps a list of texts that you could compile and think about who are we missing. But I guess the larger principle behind it for me would be whose are the perspectives that would challenge your own? Mm whose perspectives and experiences, especially if we're thinking about current events, right? Like, mm. how can you understand the long history that, like, it's not, I think in sometimes we have, a, we have amnesia, right? We have kind of cultural and historical amnesia. And so we look at, and so I'll again talk about my class. We were, we were reading this uh, story about immigration in the 20th century, and we were making connections to the kind of immigration debates now. And I was saying, you know, there are good reasons that people have on kind of, uh, like, whether to kind of uh, tighten immigration regulation or kind of expand them. And I was saying that for me, that's not as much the issue as the fact that so many of the people that are debating these issues have forgotten the entire legacy of American kind of immigration policies. And, mm. and in many ways, the, um, the, the gap between how we assume a kind of generosity and justice in our laws and actually if you one of the things we were reading was a list of all of the anti-chinese immigration that has happened between like you know the 19th century and on and to encounter the reality of that legacy and then you know and the ways that it doesn't quite fit what we may think it is yeah and so i think to kind of answer the question of the the voices or the narratives that we're missing are the ones that can explain yeah how we got to where we are, yeah. um, but also I think the ones that can challenge us to think outside of our own experience. Yeah, I love that. Well, we're gonna call time out here, okay? okay? And we're gonna invite our worship team to lead us in a reflection song. And then we're gonna invite you guys to text in and social media questions. And again, afterward, we're gonna answer them right after this. In your own education, what was mm -hmm. a disrupting or eye-opening story for you? What was a perspective you had never considered until reading it in literature? Oh, that's a good one. <sighs> Their questions are really good, just, I, just so you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can't think of a specific text that I think directly answers that, but I will answer the, a kind of text that was part of the turning point in my own education and my own kind of career path was actually Toni Morrison's Beloved. Um, and it's a story of, like set during uh, the era of slavery. Um, and so it wasn't a new story in terms of kind of slavery itself wasn't a new topic to me, but it was the way Morrison told the story that I had never seen. And one of the things that she does is, um, scholars talk about it as an example of a trauma narrative, mm. right? And so the narrative itself gets disrupted um, in a way that reflects the kind of trauma that the main character has experienced. Mm. And for me, I remember thinking, this is a, like, 
this is a text that is doing work, not just telling a story for entertainment, but it's kind of doing work on a kind of soul deep level. Mm. And that was, I think, that was it for me. Mm. It's not, I didn't just want to like read these as part of, you know, a hobby. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be part of the work to teach and like expand the audience for these types of texts. Mm, so good, so good. Okay, here's another question. What are some of your favorite examples of thought-provoking minority literature throughout American history? Okay. I'm just gonna say three, because okay. I know you could have 30, knowing you. <laughs> okay, um, so there's a piece that we read in my class by William A. Pess, and it's titled An Indian's Looking Glass for a White Man. And when we get to it in class, it's the first time we've actually read a, a text by a Native American author. Mm. But he's this, uh, he's this minister, and so he's writing from a deeply kind of uh, faith-based place. Mm -hmm. But it, it gives this challenge of what it means to kind of understand um, yourself and mm. other perspectives. So that's, that's a great one. Mm. Um, I would say anything by Toni Morrison. <laughs> Yes, it is my dream to one day teach a class just on Toni Morrison's literature. Um, and I was also thinking of one of my favorite authors is Sandra Cisneros. Okay. Um, and she's probably most known for House on Mango Street, um, but she's written poetry and fiction. But I had the privilege of being able to see her speak in person, and she described her work as she sees her writing as actually medicine in the world, mm. doing healing. And I was thinking, mm. Yeah, that's how I think about the potential for literature, is to mm. uh, be medicine in the world doing healing. Yeah, great, thank you, thank you. Here's another question. How has your view of God changed as you studied American minority literature? Okay, here's where we get honest. Okay, um, oh, I'm ready. It caused a crisis of faith and I didn't realize it for mm. me. Um, yeah. When I was in grad school, I had kind of slowly drifted away and it took me a while to realize because I couldn't even acknowledge to myself that I was angry with God because it felt like good Christians aren't angry at God. And so I had just become like more distant and more angry. Mm. Um, and I think what it was is I had been diving deep into these types of literatures and the, the kind of concerns, the things that were concerning me in the world. And I was just kind of really bothered, um, bothered with oppression and what that means and what it means. Um, and it took me a while, but I, was, I found myself sitting in a Psalms class, hearing someone um, teach about the imprecatory Psalms. And mm. I remember sitting in the kind of back corner, just like crying. Um, and it was, for me, the invitation back that mm. like I could bring my anger and my upset and my doubt and my frustrations to God, that it's, it's not healthy for me to be angry alone in the corner, ignoring God, but that I actually needed to bring them to him. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we actually do in my class is actually there's this really prominent theme in the writings of minority authors about the disruption to their faith of oppression. Yeah. And so we see these kind of two responses, that faith is sustaining, yeah. but also that um, W.B. Du Bois talks about how he asked God why kind of why he was imprisoned in his body. Mm. And so we have this conversation about what does it mean to think about oppression as a barrier to people or an obstacle for people to work out in their faith. Mm. And I think like that's been part of my story and it's also part of, I think, the process of reading minority literature. Mm. Wow, wow, thank you. Here's another question. Has your perspective ever been challenged by a non-minority? How did you handle that? Did you question your own story? It was, Inter that's an interesting way of phrasing it, and part of it is the complexity of my own identity. So I'm both I'm mixed, right? So I pr I I think for some people present visi like visibly as just kind of you know um, non-white. My mom is white, and so like there's this kind of complicated way that I think about my own embodiment, my own identity, um, and one of the things I I think about for myself, and I think about also for my students is I never want to be in a place where you feel like you've learned it all and you know it all and you can kind of sit with a sense of um, confidence and superiority, but that every, every story should be potentially yeah. destabling to our own sense of arrogance yeah. and rightness. Um, and that I often, when I read stories from, you know, so whether it's a historical text or it's a creative piece to think about, I don't want to just see myself in the person who's doing right in that story. I want mm -hmm. to potentially see myself as a person who's making the mistakes in that story um, so that I can use these stories both from kind of um, dominant or non-dominant folks to um, help me be more attentive to my blind spots. Yeah, that's great. Here's another question. 
What would you say to any first gen student mm. or student struggling to find what they want to study or do? <sighs> wow. Um, that's a great question. I think in some ways I feel I feel like the accident of my own kind of academic journey was not in the end an accident, but I had the freedom to not feel like I had to pick a uh, discipline that was tied to a kind of good, solid financial future, and I think that's some of the mm. tension often. Yeah. Um, but I often think in terms of, what are you called to? And sometimes that's not, that's not limited to a discipline or a major, right? But I would think about, be serious about asking God and kind of um, being attentive in your study to think about what are you called to and what are the kinds of um, either content or skills or disciplinary frameworks yeah. that would help prepare you for the work that you're going to be doing. Yeah. Um, and I would, the other thing I would say, and this is um, something that I often tell students when I'm advising them, is to think about the fact that it often feels like there's so much pressure at this point in your lives to make the right choice, because if you don't, it's a domino effect and everything else will kind of be ruined. That's right. But I actually think that what happens is, is we have lots of opportunity to make choices, make mistakes, and kind of, re and kind of course correct, mm -hmm. and that if we weren't so stressed about making the one right choice and saw before us a bunch of really good options, yeah. that God can kind of guide us along the way and kind of bring us more options and kind of new places that we perhaps wouldn't have anticipated, um, that maybe it takes some of the stress and anxiety out about picking the one right thing. That's right, that's right. That goes with dating too, mm -hmm. finding that one right person. Yep. It's not like that necessarily, okay? Here we go, here's another question. Why is learning about minority groups something Christians specifically should do? Is it required in order to love our neighbor well? I think yes. Right, so if we go back to the example that I was giving with the um, parable of the Good Samaritan, it struck me that I was, when I was thinking about the question today, I was thinking that Jesus actually tells a story from the minority perspective. Yeah. He tells a story from the kind of cultural and religious outsider. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that um, it's impossible to have an expansive and kind of uh, broadly neighbor-oriented worldview and like not read minority literature. I think there's perhaps a lot of ways you could cultivate an awareness for um, the experiences of your neighbor and, and kind of capacity to love them well. But from my very biased perspective, story is a great way to get there. <laughs> okay, here's another question. When thinking about cultural history and first person narratives, do you consider music and its influence on those affected by slavery and oppression? Yeah. So I think uh, part of the way I think about literature is, is among the many kind of creative forms. Um, Emerson talks about um, that when we create, we are kind of manifesting the divine, right? That like creativity is the one capacity that humans have that is actually reflective of kind of God's creative powers. Mm. And so I think it's not limited to literature or writing broadly. I think it's uh, in a lot of other creative mediums and I think um, if I had like multiple like degrees and abilities to just keep studying, I'd want to know like I'd want to know more, right? Yeah. About all the others. All right, all right. Here's another question. Soon, kind of, almost <laughs> ready. Okay, I guess not. Then I'm gonna ask you questions. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, I guess. Oh, you know what? I just came up. Okay. okay. Here we go. As a white male. What can I do to better have conversations about the minority voice? Some of the minority race and ethnicity rhetoric today comes off as anti-white. How do we have, or how do have re racial reconciliation without demonizing the, the majority? How do we have racial reconciliation? Yeah. yeah. This, this is a really complicated question, I think a really important one. Um, one of the things that we talk about in my class is the value of um, all of us coming together and talking and sharing. And I think 
Um, I frequently will have students, so the, the questioner identifies as white male, and I frequently have a kind of concern from white students or white male students about whether or not they can participate in these conversations, whether mm -hmm. they've mm -hmm. gotten messages that in some ways discourage them as in some ways like their value is, their, their perspective is less valuable. Mm. Um, and so part, like, part of the work that I'm trying to do is actually say that this is the work that we as a community need to do collectively. Yeah. Um, I do think that there is, um, we can cultivate kind of sensitivity and considerateness in how w and when we decide to kind of listen and when we decide to speak on what kinds of things. But I think um, my goal when I'm teaching is to never signal that certain voices are more important or yeah. certain voices are less important or more or less valid. Um, but I think because of the weight of history and the weight of, in particular, in my field, kind of the focus of whose voices literally get talked about, right. that in some ways it's trying, it's, to, it's trying to expand whose voices get heard, right. not about shutting off those who have already been speaking. Right, right. Okay. Here's another question. I love how the reason you study what you study is due to obeying mm -hmm. Jesus' command to love your neighbor. Exclamation point. Mm. What would your advice be to anybody who aspires to be a teacher one day in a public school? <sighs> Teachers. <sighs> so, I th so I often think that um, I teach because I want to change the world. Yeah. You know, small goal. Literature um, is medicine. Yeah, and I, I think yeah. that is what I hope someone who's called to teaching, public, private, high school, elementary, you know, university level, um, that we think about what is the world that we envision? What is the world, world that kind of our, our kind of faith encourages us to kind of participate in creating? Mm -hmm. What are the kinds of um, skills and attitudes and virtues that we want to cultivate in those students? Yeah. Um, and I think for me, literature is the vehicle that I get to do that. But I think there's all of the kind of disciplinary fields. Those, there are entry points to kind of to cultivate those um, kind of qualities. Yeah, great. Well, Shelley, the last question we always ask is, what are some of the biblical principles that helped shape your thoughts for today? I think probably what's come across is the kind of love your neighbor kind of thing. Right. Um, and I was thinking about also in my own research that I often think about the work that I do as um, expanding the notion of kind of do unto others as you would you know have done unto you and I was thinking about the ways that when I do my research in particular I study Chicana authors who write across genre and I apply to my research the lens of genre theory which is perhaps the most classical or traditional kind of literary analysis approach and for me what I'm trying to do is saying that this is the method that has been used to analyze literature throughout the centuries and these body of voices that have largely been kind of excluded from the conversation, I want to treat them in the same way that the rest of literature gets treated and say, these folks are doing beautiful, incredible, creative, brilliant things, and I want to recognize that as well. And so for me, it's a kind of, it's a way that that way of thinking it stands not just in kind of, am I being kind to the person that I encounter, but also in my, my kind of professional work, mm. right? Am I, am, li am I living out the values that I say that I hold. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.